Number five, Texas survived the Music City, walking out of First Bank Stadium with a 27 to 24 victory over number 25, Vanderbilt moving on to baseball, a walk-off Grand Slam and surviving a potential walk-off Grand Slam. Have the LA Dodgers leading in the World Series and finally, number seven, Texas Volleyball dropped their first SC loss, SEC loss of the year and their first loss since September 15th. All of this and more here on College Press Box. Good evening and welcome to College Press Box. We have an exciting show tonight, but before we get started this evening, we want to remind you that College Press Box is brought to you by Cap Metro, Austin's transit system. We connect you to work, school, play, and everywhere in between. Plan your ride to this weekend's games at capmetro.org. Now, Texas football traveled to Nashville this past weekend to take on the giant killers of Vanderbilt. Texas, who hasn't played the Commodores in 90, yes, 96 years, looked to bounce back from the home loss to the now number two Georgia Bulldogs. And ranked for the first time since 2013, Vanderbilt looked to defend their status in the Music City. 12.42 in the first quarters where we're going to start tipped at the line of scrimmage and intercepted is number 33, Martel Height. Vanderbilt will take over on the line of scrimmage. Next play, Pavia does it himself, running for 18 yards, trying to find room and scores for a touchdown. Look at the replay, diving to the pylon. Vanderbilt strikes first off the Ewers interception. Next drive, Quinn Ewers gets out of the pocket, throws over to Matthew Golden for a touchdown, and Texas is back on the clock. Back on the scoreboard. Look at that one-handed grab. Golden with no bond. No bond. No problem for the Longhorns. Next drive. 27 yards to the far sideline. DeAndre Moore has it for a touchdown. Texas takes their first lead of the game with 119 left in the first quarter. Next quarter. Michael Taft gets the tip off the sideline. Takes it up to the line of scrimmage. Michael Taft grabs his first interception of the the game in Texas now seems to be rolling in Nashville. Second quarter still, 5-11 left. Quinn Ewers to DeAndre Moore. Once again, it'll be a quick pass, and he has space. We'll take it all the way for a touchdown. Longhorns pull ahead now, 21-27, with a little over five minutes left. After the interception, Quinn would go 18 for 18 for his next 18 throws. And now on the next drive, Michael Taft had the interception already today. Now forces the fumble, his first of the year. And the Longhorns are playing well. Quinn Ewers now rolls out to the right. And that one's tipped in the third quarter. Does The score is 24 to 10. And Vanderbilt finding some momentum. Now has the ball fourth and goal. Diego Pavia throws a dart to Junior Sherrill. And now the Vanderbilt Commodores make it a one possession game. Both touchdowns come off Quinn Ewers interception so far. Fourth quarter now, less than a minute. Emergency time for the Commodores and they find the end zone making it a three point game. Don't go anywhere because Eli Stowers is in the end zone and it looks like David's coming to get Goliath Longhorns. Obviously seeing what happened to Bama last week and now a lot on the onside kick handled by DeAndre Moore. Texas survive, improve their record to three and one. Vanderbilt falls to five and three. Ken DeLunger had the opportunity to travel to Nashville covering for TSTV Sports. Here was her coverage of this past Saturday's heart-stopping battle at First Bank Stadium. Here at First Bank Stadium, we have a top 25 matchup between the Texas Longhorns and the Vanderbilt Commodores. It'll be a quarterback battle out here tonight with Quinn Ewers for Texas and Diego Pavia for Vanderbilt, who has sparked a lot of attention this season after beating Alabama. After Texas's stunning loss to Georgia at home last week, head coach Steve Sarkeesian looks to get his offense back on track. Texas started with the ball and the drive ended with the first of two tip ball interceptions for Ewers during the game. Pavia answered to the turnover with a rushing touchdown and took the lead first. Vanderbilt used both interceptions to their advantage in scoring 14 points. The Longhorns faced 10 penalties for a total loss of 107 yards and took away a defensive touchdown. In comparison to the Commodores' four penalties for a loss of 35 yards, it was a close back-and-forth battle between the two teams for the full 60 minutes. Sarkeesian was complimentary of the strong Vanderbilt team and looks ahead to the bye week as a way to clean up on turnovers and penalties as they have been an ongoing issue for the Longhorns this season. I thought this game tonight was a culture, was a toughness win for us. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of our players and their preparation. I was proud of the way they, they handled the adversity tonight. We knew it was going to take 60 minutes against this, this style of team. And um, 
you know, it's again, it's always good to get a to get a road win. And I, like I said before, that was a good football team. They weren't 25th in the country on accident. And there you have it. The Texas Longhorns defeat the Vanderbilt Commodores 27 to 24. With Texas having the bye next week, they hope to use this close game and learn from the mistakes heading into the rest of the season. Reporting from Nashville, I'm Kenna Lunger with TSTV Sports. What an awesome experience that must have been for Kendall. Great coverage from Nashville. For more analysis, I'll turn it over to my co-host, Max Dagley. Max? Thank you, Zach. I'm joined with Ian Massoud here to bring us more from his perspective of Texas's performance in Nashville. Thank you for joining us, Ian. Yeah, it's always nice to be back in the studio, and it's even better after a Texas win. A narrow victory, but it keeps the Longhorns' loss at one for now. Exactly. A win is a win at the end of the day. But after the last two games, a lot of different people have things to say about Quinn Ewers. What about his performance on Saturday impressed you, and what do you think he needs to improve on as the Longhorns enter the final stretch of the season? The two interceptions are really going to stand out to a lot of people, but those picks came off tip passes. Even Texas head coach Steve Sarkeesian said that he wouldn't fault Quinn for those INTs. After the first pick of the game, Ewers completed 17 straight, a straight barrage of passes. Sark saw the need for Quinn to be comfortable and consistent after one of his worst career games and game planned it precisely that way. The three first half touchdowns were all passes from Ewers and essentially had perfect placement. The concepts worked to perfection, allowing for a great bounce back performance from Ewers, even considering the trouble they ran into during the second half. <clears throat> A 73% completion rate this week compared to 58% last week is a substantial stat that can be taken away from the past two weeks and can confirm that Quinn just had a bad game and is indeed still a good quarterback. But I think there are some things that need to be fixed. Quinn's health needs to be prioritized more for his confidence. Three seasons with Texas and he has missed more than a couple games in each season. In the past two weeks, Ewers has been sacked nine times. Whether it's Quinn failing to step up in the pocket or a missed assignment from the O-line, it's clear that these hits and injuries have impacted Ewers' confidence. He looks more hesitant and, and just doesn't look like week one and week two Ewers. And especially in the intermediate game, he just hasn't looked as fluid. Yeah, Quinn definitely hasn't looked like himself, but hopefully in this bye week, him and Sark can figure things out. Changing gears here, defensively, Texas forced three takeaways, had zero sacks, and held the rushing and passing game to a combined total of less than 300 yards. What are your thoughts on the defense against Vandy and going forward? Well, if you asked me before the season which side of the ball would be best, I would have put special or defense last for sure, but since then I have been severely proven wrong. The score says it was a three-point game, but going play-by-play, -play, a majority of points come off Texas turnovers. Short drives from short field position kept Vandy in this game till the end. In the first quarter, Quinn Ewers throws a pick and Vandy starts at the 31. Vandy then proceeds to score a touchdown, and then later in the game, Miles Caper gets a pick for the Commodores and they start at the Texas 38 and then convert. Just like that, Vandy scores 14 points off Texas takeaways. All this to say, the score in the last two weeks has not reflected the defensive effort the Longhorns have really put in. I would say yes, the defense played one of their worst games this season, but they still haven't had a quote-unquote bad game. Jade Barron is still the front runner for the Jim Thorpe Award. 29 total tackles, 17 solo tackles, along with six passes deflected and three interceptions. As a DB, you're going to be trusted to be put on an island and will be trusted to make consistent tackles. Barron has done that in this secondary throughout the season has looked great. Look out for true freshman Kobe Black to make some big plays as the season goes on. He was a DFW standout four star and his depth will be required as some vets start feeling the natural wear and tear of football season. Defense has definitely been a consistency this season and you know we hope to see that as the season goes on. Now, Ian, after this bye week, the Longhorns have a month left in the regular season. At the end of November, the season will be topped off with the return of the Lone Star Showdown, and I know this is the game you've looked forward to the most since the move to the SEC. Give us a rundown on some things to look at before this highly anticipated matchup. 
Yeah, well, November 30th has been the date that I've been screaming at all my Aggie friends since the schedule was released, and I'm so glad that we're seeing this great rivalry again. It's looking to be a top 10 matchup. The Aggies and Longhorns will be favored in their remaining games, and if both teams win those games, this matchup will probably send one of them to the SEC Championship. Texas's defense has to keep on playing like their hair is on fire. This bye week will be good time for vets to rest up before they continue playing like a top defense in the nation. But if the defensive play does stall out and break down in the last month, it's going to be really hard for the Longhorns to win this one. As a reminder, this game is going to be played at Kyle Field. With college football playoff hopes on the line, the SEC championship, and a potential bye week up for grabs, if you don't think the decibel and attendance record are going to be broken, you're probably delusional. A&M is coming off a season-changing win. Beating LSU is as big, if not bigger, than what it would have meant for Texas to beat Georgia. The run game, most specifically, will need to stay healthy and deep. Marcel Reed changed that LSU game with his legs. While it won't be the best quarterback Texas has faced, it's going to be a challenge like no other. To me, if Texas can lean on Trey Wisner in that O-line, they can really bully their way into a win, but Shamar Stewart in the Aggies' front seven is their best unit. It'll be a really exciting matchup, and it's going to be really emotional, and like you said, I can't wait for it. Thank you for that great input. It's always a pleasure, Ryan. I'll toss it back to Zach at the desk. Thank you, Max and Ian. When we return to College Press Box, the 120th Fall Classic has been one of the most hyped World Series in recent memory. Perla Paredes returns to pitch her takes of what transpired thus far. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to College Press Box. The World Series is back, and two of baseball's most historic franchises, the Yankees and the Dodgers, are duking it out. For more, let's turn it over to Zach with a special guest. Thanks, Max. I'm stopping by with Perla Paredes. Perla, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm excited to see some more good baseball that we, we will surely get this week. Surely indeed, LA won game one of the World Series in extra innings and took an early lead in game two as well. Why do you think the Dodgers have been able to win not just game one, but game two as well in this series so far. I want to start off with game one. Um, the Dodgers started Jack Flaherty, a pitcher they signed at the dread trade deadline this year, which is usually uncommon. You usually start an established ace in your locker room already, and you're building off that groundwork by top tier pitcher like Fran Reveldes from the Astros, Tariq Skubal from the Tigers, or Garrett Cole on the other side with the Yankees, but Flaherty stepped up. He delivered an impressive five scoreless inning with six strikeouts. His fastball strikes were way up with 21 out of 30 coming into the top of the six. That pitch set up his breaking ball and that fielding was also behind him. This performance is significant, especially considering that the Dodgers have struggled with pitching in the playoffs in recent years, like with veteran Clayton Kershaw, who has had some rough outings historically. In game two, another key addition from this year, Yoshinubu, Yamamoto, that, that is always, <laughs> took the mound and pitched six and a third innings with only one hit, which was a home run for Juan Soto. That has been a major difference for the Dodgers this year, the strength of their starting pitching, which has allowed them to go deep into games. They have also effectively game plan against Aaron Judge, holding him to only six strikeouts over the two games that he's played. With this solid pitching staff, the Dodgers have been able to keep games close enough for their star players to make a difference. In game one, for instance, we, we were, they were down by one rung in the bottom of the 10th until Freddie Freeman hit the first ever walk-up grand slam in game two. The team, I was, I was so excited to see him after the year that he's had. But the team took an early lead and contributed to build, in the game two, the team took an early lead and contributed to build on it, getting men on base and hits against solidifying the win with the home run from Freeman in the bottom of the third. He has had a, quite a World Series 
play. <laughs> Overall, I believe this year pitching depth has been a game changer for the Dodgers in the postseason, which has allowed the stars and the team to show up. It, it builds that security to go out and, you know, hit that wall. <laughs> yeah. Now looking at the Yankees, what do you think New York has to do to tie this series? Again, I'm going to have to go with the pitching. I feel like that's where it always starts. In order for the Yankees to win these next two games, they need to keep their – and they keep the games close enough late where their stars have a chance to shine. One player who has certainly has to do more as well as able to produce for them is one of the biggest stars in the game, the big, in the biggest stages, Aaron Judge. He is currently only batting 150. You're not going to win a seven-game series with guys at the top of your line of not producing. Sure, that has worked for them in the regular season, but if you can't make adjust adjustments game to game in, in, in a seven-game series with each at bat meaning more than basically any regular season game, they won't win. You have to be able to adjust. We've seen that fall from the Dodgers before, and it's another reason why they're here now. They have been able to change that, and their big names are finally coming up and putting up big innings. New York led an amazing outing in game one by Gary Cole, virtually go to waste and in. They have showed up and did almost nothing offensively in the second game, putting up only two runs on four hits, half of which half of which came from one guy, Juan Soto. I think they also need to bring in those guys at the bottom of the lineup, more involved like your seven and nine hitters. Going two for 24 in the first two games is not going to cut it again. You need them to go on base for your big guys in order for them to put cooker numbers in the Dodgers away or swing momentum in the start of the game or even late in the game, I would say. You know, Perla, big series. You know, Dodgers took home the first two. So my last question is to, to you, what player has stood out to you the most in the World Series and the playoffs? I'm going to go with the Dodgers. Like one guy who has almost come out of nowhere for me and really surprised me is the NLCS MVP, Todd Edmund. Tommy Edmund. Bringing him over from the Drake deadline, Edmund has been huge for the Dodgers in the postseason. He's currently hitting 365 with two home runs and 13 RBIs in 13 games played for the Dodgers. He's really stepped up in the postseason, considering he hit 239 on six home runs in the entire 2024 regular season. On top of that, he's played amazing defense. He's has, he has had a 682 fielding percentage with only one error as a utility player, which is insane, I would say. He's also went two for four in game one with a double and a run scored. He also opened up the scoring in game two with the home run that we saw, and then Soto responded in the next inning. Edmund has been one of those quiet players that has slowly contributed so much to the Dodgers, and I'm excited to see what he continues to do throughout this series. I'm excited too, Perla. Such a two high-powering mm -hmm. franchises. I really hope it goes to seven. But thank you so much for joining the show. I'll shoot it back over to my guy, Max, over at the table. Thanks to the both of you. When we come back on College Press Box, we'll take a closer look at Texas volleyball after a surprising upset at Gregory Gymnasium this past week. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to College Press Box. Texas Volleyball was upset against the Texas A&M Aggies last week at Gregory Gymnasium. Their first loss in SEC play. For more, let's go back to Max. I'm glad to be Assistant producer of College Press Box, Devony Serta. How are you doing, Devony? You know, it's good. It kind of rolls reverse. So, I mean, very excited to talk Texas Volleyball. So, let's get into it. So, Texas A&M gets their revenge back on Texas by upsetting them at home. What went wrong for the Horns in this game? I don't think anything actually went wrong. I mean, both teams played a great match, and I mean, it went to five sets. This was a game that emotions ran high, and Texas A&M would eventually come on top, winning in Austin, forget this, the first time since 2001. The opening set is ultimately what set the tone. The Longhorns would win 27-25, to and they would also rely heavily on a block and also Devin Kahahawai 
who would have three aces and was on an absolute roll. The Aggies, however, would dominate in the second set, holding Texas to just 14 points, which is exactly how the second set went last time these two teams met up over at a and the fifth set is kind of where things got a little interesting and they would point, they would literally go point for point and Texas A&M ultimately was able to pull out a win. Like I said, I don't think anything wrong necessarily. Texas just wasn't the best team that night, which is kind of bizarre to think about considering you have Madison Skinner, who set a season high of 22 kills, and you had Reagan Rutherford, the Kentucky transfer, who had 13 of her own. Plus, Texas had a total of 15 blocks. Well, other than playing their own brand of volleyball that fans are used to seeing, what area do you think Texas needs to improve the most on as they host Missouri on Wednesday? You know, I think Texas really needs to cut down on the errors. I know I just said nothing necessarily went wrong around Texas A&M, but it's just like silly little mistakes that are hurting them in the long run, which every team has. You know, we're all human. Everyone makes mistakes. But against the Aggies, in the past three games, the Longhorns had just 20. They had 26 22, 15, and 15 errors against both of their opponents. Last season, the most, the, low, the most that they allowed was just 25. Compared to this season, that number is at 31, and that was against University of Miami. Now, I understand this is a young Texas team, and it's a bit unfair to compare and contrast, but Texas brought in key transfers and have players come off the bench and produce numbers like Mariana Singletary and Devin Kahawai, and even freshman Ada Names, who is also Gatorade Player of the Year last year. Going into Missouri, the Tigers technically have a small advantage as former Texas walk-on and their setter, Mariana Crownover, is over there. While she didn't get to see the court much at Texas, she knows the offense, she knows what it's like to play on the atmosphere, and she knows what spots these Longhorns like to hit. As a setter, she kind of has the advantage to anticipate the block and be able to be a little sneaky with it. After all, this is going to be a homecoming game. She is originally from Austin. Crownover has not only been elite for this Tiger defense, but she's also recorded a couple double-doubles and has won SEC Setter of the Week twice. Texas should cruise past Mizzou, but Crownover and the Tigers might be a problem if Texas keeps making silly, silly errors. Also, people forget Missouri is currently in second place in the conference with a 6-2 and two record right behind the Longhorns. So it should be an interesting matchup on Wednesday. Yeah, uh, as the season is looking to wrap up, with all these players, with all this depth, who do you think will earn an SEC award at the end of the year? I mean, the SEC is a stacked, it's stacked with talent in volleyball. Now, I know it's not the Big Ten or the ACC, but, you know, it's still a pretty stacked conference. I know most people will assume Madison Skinner will earn an award, and I'm not trying to discredit her. I think she will earn an award, but someone who has been lethal on this offense that most people don't necessarily, and she really came out of left field and, in my opinion, really deserves an award, is Mariana Singletary. The redshirt sophomore has been a huge asset at the net. I mean, she did help, she, it did help that she was under Asia O'Neill last year and the year before that, but Singletary has been named SEC Player of the Week for three consecutive times. She also poses a 92% block rate with a hitting rate of a .382. Singletary brings a positive energy in the lineup and is a fierce block. She also has come up in such club moments that I don't think anyone was expecting for her to step up the way she did. Alongside Devin Kahahawai, aside from star players like Madison Skinner, Emma Halter, I would not be and Reagan Rutherford. I would not be surprised if Singletary earns either second team or even first team. But again, an SEC is very stacked. But I think any of those names are deserving for an SEC award, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Singletary's emergence is one that cannot be ignored, and I'm sure she'll be a huge factor in Texas' effort to bounce back on Wednesday. Thank you for that analysis, Deb. Back to you at the desk, Zach. Thank you. Ebony and Max, when we return to College Press Box, we'll take a look at the past week in Longhorn Sports and look forward at what's to come. Stick around with us on College Press Box.
Welcome back to College Press Box. Let's take a look at this past week in Longhorn Sports. The AP poll came out last week for Texas men's basketball, and the Longhorns are officially 19th in the rankings. Alabama, Auburn, Tennessee, Texas A&M, and Arkansas are all the SEC schools ahead of the Longhorns. Texas, who returned just two key players, looked in the portal in the offseason, as well as bringing in five-star stud Trey Johnson. The Longhorns will open their season in the Las Vegas showdown against Ohio State on Monday, November 4th. After helping the Longhorns finish third at the Stanford Intercollegiate, sophomore Farah O'Keefe was named the SEC Women's Golfer of the Week with a stellar scorecard of seven under par in her final round. O'Keefe tallied five birdies on the day and also made eagle on a 490-yard par five on the seventh, which was capped off with a 25-yard putt. O'Keefe plays third at the tournament, and her total of score of 64 ties the Longhorn program record for the lowest 18-hole score. O'Keefe, who was added to the Annika Award watch list earlier this year, continues to build her case as the best female collegiate golfer. And finally, Texas senior offensive lineman Jake Majors has been named a Campbell Trophy finalist, an award annually recognized the best combined efforts of academic success, football performance, and exemplary leadership in the country. He is one of 16 finalists, which means he was already awarded an $18,000 postgraduate scholarship. The winner will be announced on Thursday, December 12th, and be interviewed live on ESPN. Now, let's take a look at this week in Longhorn Sports. On Friday, volleyball plays Missouri at 8 p.m. on the SEC Network. And the SEC Cross Country Championship is on SEC Network Plus. On Sunday, volleyball plays Oklahoma at 1 p.m. on SEC Network Plus. Monday, men's basketball opens up the season versus Ohio State at 9 p.m. on TNT, True TV, or Max. And it's the Hall of Fame Series opening night. And that will conclude this week's edition of College Press Box. Please make sure to tune in to our other shows this week, including College Crossfire, Wednesdays airing at 9 p.m., and the 1-0 Sports Show on Fridays, now at 11 a.m. Thank you to our analysts, everyone in Master Control, our executive producer, of course, Joseph Duffy, and everyone else at TSTV. I'm Zach Davis. He's Max Dagley. Thank you for joining us, and have a good night.